Hello, it's your friend Phil, project management trainer and coach. We have students who are taking the exam. And the question that I often get is, what do I need to do when it is one, two, or three days to my PMP exam? So today we are going to focus on agile deep thinking for your PMP exam in people, process, and business. And I'm going to give you some one day to the PMP exam advice all rolled up in one. This is actually a very condensed session. I'm going to squeeze 20 hours of learning into 20 minutes. So let's first of all examine agile deep thinking because I want you to get the low hanging fruit for your exam. When I say think agile, I mean espouse the manifesto details inside out. You need to be thinking about people first, communicating as often as possible. Remember, face-to-face -face is preferred. You also need to have a positive mental attitude. The questions will pose challenges in that you could choose a negative mindset, one of punishment power, or you could choose one of mentoring and coaching. If a team member is not performing up to par, what are you going to do? Punish them? Or would you train and coach them? Would you help them to understand better ways of doing things? Be nice to people. Punishment is rarely a good course of action. Are there some times that people need to be given a slap on the wrist for poor choices and bad behavior in an organization? Yes, but that is rarely PMI's focus on these questions. Cross-functional teams are important. It's important to see within each team, people need to jump in to help each other. That is the entire idea when we talk about cross-functional teams, T-shaped scales, broken comb, paint drip. Those are words you should know. Work with the customer relentlessly. Have a collaborative mindset as opposed to one of negotiation. Understand that change is good. Kaizen, change for the better. When your customer needs a change, give them the change to the extent possible. Empower the team. In order to think agile, you need to have a collaborative mindset when it comes to working with teams to manage conflict. When it comes to leading a team, think servant leadership. Think situational leadership. Not a one-size-fits-all for everyone, but everyone on that team is a unique individual. If you are working with them, work with them with the Hersey Blanchard model at the back of your mind. As a leader in an organization, you should support the team's performance. Supporting their performance means you are helping them grow, you are helping them understand their performance and giving them feedback in a friendly, non-threatening manner. The exam will test you on agile think across people, process, and business. The understanding of building a team, equipping the team, appraising their skills is important. When it comes to the team being stuck, you should remember your definite chief aim as a scrum master or servant leader is to continually reassess those impediments obstacles and blockers get them out of the way prioritize them big rocks first smaller pebbles sand next but you want to attack those pesky impediments first negotiate all agreements be it an agreement about velocity schedule cost even what have you but in the back of your mind, you need to read page 77 to understand an overarching master services agreement 
with smaller little agreements is helpful. Read that in the Agile Practice Guide. Have a mindset of collaboration, seeking to understand first before being understood. And that means using a method such as the dig sieve approach to break down the problem. Define the problem, identify the root cause, generate alternatives, choose the best alternative, implement that alternative, and verify that it actually worked. As a servant leader, you must engage and support virtual teams. You should investigate the best way of engaging your team. Terms such as osmotic communication, information radiators, fishbowl window should come to mind. Understanding concepts for not only collaborating, but learning and mentoring are important. The concept of pair programming, understanding the team charter, page 49 and 50 in your Agile Practice Guide will go a long way to help you. Understanding the importance of mentoring, promoting team performance by using emotional intelligence. These will help you immensely on your exam. When it comes to the process piece from an agile perspective, you need to also approach it from a softer side, even though it's agile. Let me explain what I mean. When you think about executing a project from an agile perspective, in the back of your mind should be people, value, business value. In order to execute this project with a bunch of processes, I should be doing it to deliver value to my client. And I should be thinking, how can I deliver value in increments? Not in one big clump, but in increments. When it comes to communications, your mindset, your thought process should be, how can I get the communication as expediently as possible to those who need it? My team members, osmotic communication, information radiators, co-located team. When it comes to risk management in the world of Agile, this is something that is built into the process, multiple iterations. When it comes to engaging stakeholders, you must think first, the primary reason I'm doing this is success for my customer. So when you engage stakeholders, you're doing it with a purpose to succeed with your customer. Your strategy for engagement is all about what works best for the customer. When it comes to planning and managing budget and resources, I would like you to pay close attention to page 92. And page 92 in the Agile Practice Guide, it reads, projects with high degrees of uncertainty may not benefit from detailed cost calculations due to frequent changes. Instead, lightweight estimation methods can be used to generate a fast high level forecast. So in your mind, fast high level forecasts are preferred from an agile perspective because the scope hasn't been fully defined Keep that in the back of your mind when answering Agile-related questions that may pertain to cost. In the same token as it pertains to schedule, you should remember that in the world of Agile, adaptive approaches use short cycles. Your sprint is not going for years on end, at best, four weeks. So these short cycles provide rapid feedback on the approaches and suitability of deliverables and generally manifest as iterative scheduling and on-demand pull-based scheduling. Remember the importance of looking at pull-based systems instead of pushing work on people. 
That is also something to think about. Think about flow-based agile, Kanban, iteration-based agile, the world of Scrum, and understand how scheduling could be done in iterations and in a just-in-time approach when it comes to flow-based. When it comes to quality, quality is built in to the processes of Agile. Within a Scrum framework, the constant iterations enable check-in periodically, not just in sprint reviews, but you need to remember that sprint retrospectives are also a perfect way of self-inspection within the team that is also part of quality. So it's important to remember quality in Agile is built in. During retrospectives, the team regularly checks on the effectiveness of the quality process. They look at the root cause of issues, then suggest trials of new approaches to improve quality. When it comes to scope management from an Agile perspective, you should remember your product backlog can change according to EEFs, Enterprise Environmental Factors, factors in the enterprise or factors that are in the marketplace could wildly affect your product backlog, sometimes might negate so many of those stories in your backlog. When it comes to integration from an agile perspective, you should remember that the team is front and center, not the project manager, because there is no project manager theoretically in the world of Scrum. So in the world of Scrum, using it as an example, integration is done by the team. Managing project changes is also important. But remember, if you want to change anything within the sprint, it has to go through the product owner and changes during the sprint are forbidden. Generally, could they happen? They could, but they must go through the product owner. Remember that changes to any part of the product backlog must be approved, first of all, by the product owner, if it is going to be done. With that said, anyone can add to the product backlog. But once the product backlog has been prioritized, once you get an idea of what to be done in the next sprint, those ideas should be held in place as much as possible, and any changes must go through the product owner. It is a very powerful role. It is a role that should be respected. And if there's no respect for the product owner, there could be problems. You could get questions that really test your understanding of these roles. So I want to encourage you, if you have not already done so, do read page 40, page 41 in your Agile Practice Guide. Page 40 starts off with Agile roles. In Agile, three common roles are used. It reads cross-functional team members, product owner, and team facilitator. Be sure to understand these three. The product owner works with stakeholders, customers, and the teams to define the product direction. Typically, product owners have a business background and bring subject matter expertise of a deep nature to the decisions. Sometimes the product owner requests help from people with deep domain expertise, such as architects or deep customer expertise, such as product managers. In Agile, product owners create the backlog for and with the team. And the backlog helps the team see how to deliver the highest value without creating waste. And for that reason, I often refer to the product owner as a chief value officer. A critical success factor for Agile teams is strong product ownership. Without attention to the highest value for the customer, the Agile team may create features that are not appreciated or otherwise insufficiently valuable, therefore wasting effort. So in your big run-up to your exam, you should recognize these roles talked about on page 40 and 41 of the Agile Practice Guide. When it comes to planning and managing procurement, just remember high-level MSA, 
flexible arrangements, that's the way to go. Page 77 talks about a lot of these contracts. Remember, in managing project artifacts, we have three artifacts in the world of Scrum, product backlog, sprint backlog, and PSI. But also remember that in a wider world of Agile, we might refer to other things as artifacts, storyboards, burn-up charts, burn-down charts, CFDs, and so on. It is important, again, to assess how to execute a project, which approach to use, methodology, methods, practices. Should we go with an iterative, incremental, agile, or predictive approach? Should we go with a hybridized approach? What does that look like on page 27 and 28 in the Agile Practice Guide? Understand those models for hybridization. Understand that governance is not a bad word. It is the framework in which authority is exercised. Understand the importance of managing issues from a predictive standpoint. But when we talk about issues, a lot of times we're really using the word issue to replace impediment. As a good project manager, be proactive before a risk becomes an issue. You should have already thought about it. Make sure that you're transferring knowledge so the project can continue. In the world of Agile, this is done daily and continuously. Daily scrums, sprint reviews, backlog refinement, sprint retrospective, sprint planning. These are all vehicles for sharing knowledge and ensuring project continuity. When you are closing out a project or phase, in the world of predictive, it is different. In the world of Agile, we are ready to close at any time. In the sprint, remember, what you are doing is iterative. You could be in a sprint and receive word it is the final sprint. You should be able to close out the sprint expediently without having to go five sprints back to look for lessons learned, because those lessons learned are not documented from the world of Scrum. In the world of Scrum, our retrospective is where we hold those conversations sacred. They are not shared outside of the team. They are not documented outside of the team. So that knowledge is with the team. And that's why as much as possible, we do not like changing team members. We want to keep the team as intact as possible so that those great behaviors that have been learned, overcoming the five stages of team development and getting to the performance stage is kept intact. When we talk about Agile from a business perspective, you want to think about compliance. Compliance should also be thought about even in Agile. And these are things that could make their way into the product backlog. When we talk about benefits and value from the world of Agile in business, value trumps everything else. The product owner arranges those backlog items based on two parameters, largely value and risk. High risk, high value do. Low risk, high value, do next. Low value, low risk, do. High risk, low value, avoid. Make sense to not do. When it comes to evaluating the business environment from an agile perspective, this is something the product owner and the team should be involved in doing, but more so, the product owner. The product owner should continually review the business environment for impacts on the project, the product backlog to be precise. When it comes to understanding how organizational change impacts the project and vice versa, all team members should have an awareness of this but most importantly, the servant leader should be well aware of how to support organizational change. And that is how you need to be thinking for your exam from an agile perspective.
agile is huge on the exam. It has been said time and time again. What is my advice for you one day to the PMP exam? My advice is very simple. You must be calm, cool, action ready, a leader of yourself, and mindful. Let's expand on these just a little bit further. C is for cool, confident, collected, amidst other things. Let me explain these. In my mind, when I say someone needs to be cool, I mean really relaxed. You need to be confident that you can do it, collected, composed, comfortable, and you need to cut off. There's no point studying up till 12 midnight, and there is no point cramming. What you know, you know, but it's more in the mindsets that I've talked about for the past 20 minutes that you need to focus on from an agile perspective, and even those permeate into predictive as well. So be cool, confident, collected, and composed. Know that you've got this. Cut off 7 p.m. the night before, watch a movie, eat a nice meal, call it a day until you exam. Secondly, be aware and action ready. Things happen on the exam that will blow your mind. Students go into the exam thinking, this is the day I will finish with the PMP, only to discover the computer had a different idea. Some folks go into the test centers only to discover the machines are not acting right. Some folks start off taking the exam when all of a sudden there's a power cut. What are you going to do? You need to be aware. You need to be action ready. And if anything happens that requires you take your exam on a different day, just remember, be cool. You're six feet above ground. You have every reason to be happy. The exam is not the end of the world. And that needs to be your mindset. Because when these things happen, people often think it's the end of the world. But it's not. We need to remind ourselves to be aware, to be action ready, and to be cool. L, lead yourself. Less is more. To be a good leader of yourself. You need to understand your brain is not a machine. You are not a machine. Less is more. Stop cramming. Stop forcing information into your head that cannot go in at the last minute. And have overarching thoughts instead. Instead of reading the entire Agile Practice Guide the night before, how about you listen to this video again and again instead of you reading the PMBOK guide over and over again, trying to cram 49 things that you should have understood, not crammed. It's not the best way to go. So less is more one day to the exam. I would advise listening to this video over and over again and telling yourself you are a success. You are a champion. You are a victor in this battle towards this exam. That needs to be your mindset, no matter what, no matter how you feel. When you're in the exam, I want you to remember, I told you this. You need to be cool, calm, collected, aware, and a leader. And what does a leader do? A leader gives the people hope. Lead yourself. Remember, less is more. Last but not least, be mindful. Mindful of your resources. Mindful that second guessing yourself is a poor choice. Don't do it.
And that is the overarching framework for thinking going into the exam. You got to be calm. Remember my overarching mindsets? This is the project mnemonic. P, be a problem solver. R, respect authority. When you're answering questions on the exam, you need to be a problem solver, but you also need to respect authority. Do not go beyond your stated authority. Respect authority. And don't disrespect authority. O is for own the problem. Do not pass the blame. J is for just what is required. No goal plating. E, equip the team, mentor, train, coach. There's an expectation that you do this. Escalate as appropriate. C, changes are important, but review and check impact before doing. If a change has been approved, then it will be done. But when a change comes, you should always review it. Do an impact analysis. T, the final one, is take responsibility. Be accountable and show servant leader qualities. And that is the project acronym for your exam. It's all in the thinking. You must own the problem. You must move that situation forward. Saying no to someone is not the best answer because it doesn't move the situation forward. So instead, take responsibility. Be a great leader. Let's talk about Agile Think one more time. People, communications, positivity, likability, not using punishment power, understanding the cross-functional team and the T-shape and the paint drip and the broken comb, working with the customer daily, understanding change is not evil, it's good, and empowering the team. Now we've talked quite a bit about the world of Agile, we should talk about the world of predictive at a very high level. You will get questions of a predictive nature that may fall into the initiating process group. For this, you want to know your project charter components and your overall project risks. You also want to understand that the high level requirements and overall project risks are indeed part of your project charter. You also want to remember that preliminary scope comes before the project. In other words, your customer, before signing the dotted line, sends out an RFP that has some preliminary scope details that must come before the project. It is a strange term, but be aware that it does exist. Now, when you hear the term new project, sometimes that term new project could mean this is something we're thinking of doing. It does not immediately mean this is authorization. When you hear the term new project, read between the lines and deduce if the project manager has already been assigned. If yes, that could mean there's already a charter in place. But if it says you are being looked at as someone who could manage this new project and that project has not been authorized and similar language, be very comfortable when it comes to initiating understanding that the project charter authorizes the project. Before the project charter is authorized, there are some pre initiating events on page 30 in the PMBOK guide. You've got to understand the business case. Now, the business case and the benefits management plan are important. Understand that an output of developed project charter is the assumptions log. 
the assumption log, we use that for all manner of assumptions. Schedule assumptions such as lead time could be in there. Understand that facilitation is important. It's the name of the game in initiating. You even come across some conflict even way early in initiating. Understand that meeting management is important. Stakeholder identification could come in cycles before the project charter is authorized. And that's why one of the outputs within the project charter, we call it a key stakeholder list. This is not a project charter. This is not a stakeholder register. It's a key stakeholder list. The stakeholder register should be updated. So going into identifying stakeholders and initiating, just remember you have your project charter that goes in to identify stakeholders with the key stakeholder list. We build on that stakeholder list. That's how the stakeholder register is created. Going into planning, know your risk strategies. A team, avoid, transfer, escalate, avoid, mitigate. Avoid, transfer, escalate, accept, mitigate. The two A's, avoid, accept. Understand your positive strategies. So things such as the E-A-S-E-E, -E -E, escalate, accept, share, exploit, enhance, easy. Know those two. Know your early start and late start relationships and all of those dependencies. Understand that firm fixed price is favored a lot over time and materials when it comes to predictive projects. Your customer wants to know what they are likely to pay in total. When it comes to the aspect of executing, understand that interpersonal and soft skill use is better than relying on tools. Also, it is emphasized. Questions will test your understanding of interpersonal and soft skills, even from a predictive standpoint. That is why a lot of people are tricked into thinking they are in agile questions because they are very interpersonal and soft skills heavy. Those are not agile questions. Instead, you can think of those as hybrid questions. Monitoring and controlling. Always follow recommended change control procedures. Understand you have no control over people's ability to request changes. Changes are not bad. Understand that variance analysis is used in monitoring and controlling. And when it comes to closing, page 123 in the PMBOK guide is important. Follow the recommended closure procedures. Administrative closure, contract closure, closing out documents, releasing resources, releasing the team, understanding why a project was terminated, and things such as that are all important. Now, in closing, I want you to start getting into the zone of exam questions. What do I mean? I'm talking about still with a calm mindset. Take a look at sample questions and be prepared to face questions like this that ask the question, what should the project manager do next? What should the project manager do first? Without considering all the implications, your project sponsor requires that the project team be composed of resources located in three locations in three different time zones. This is expected to save cost and provide the optimal project team. Where should this be reflected in the project charter?
Remember, in the project charter, the answer given to this is A. Having a dispersed team does not come without risks. These risks need to be identified in the risk log for the project. Now, I am showing you these up front so that you get into the mind zone for the exam. That zone of thinking for the exam should be one of fearlessness. Do not be scared of the questions you're seeing. Instead, let it warm you up to be in that zone the moment you get in. Let's take a look at yet another question. You are the project manager and your troubled project needs resource support from a supplier because several team members have been transferred to another project run by the CEO. Concerns arise about the cost risk of using a supplier at this stage of the project. You're working with the procurement team to establish specifications and the type of contract that should be used. What type of contract should you recommend? Now, the answer to this given by the question writer is D, a fixed price incentive fee contract. The reason why I decided to show you questions of a slightly challenging nature is to build your courage to face the worst of questions. The good news, your questions on the exam will likely not be of this type. However, you should be prepared to face questions of a difficult nature, should they show up, as we have heard this from a number of people. Now that you've had a taste of predictive questions, why don't we take a look at questions of an agile nature? Just a few to get you into that thinking zone. This reads, the team is conducting a review meeting with the product owner, and there are disagreements about whether the deliverables product increment for the iteration are acceptable. What step was not adequately completed? So this is getting you into the zone that's the purpose, to be in the zone with the language. The answer is not what I am after in this review, but it's warming you up to get into that mind zone for the exam. This question was written by a seasoned project manager. This project manager has been managing projects for over three decades and got certified over 25 years ago. The answer given to this is the definition of done was not addressed properly. Those are terms that you should be comfortable with. Here's another question. Which of the following is not a hallmark of communications in agile teams? The answer to this sticks out like a sore thumb because it is not mentioned anywhere in the Agile Practice Guide. The answer, a was, work authorization system. Be ready to face questions that you have never seen before on your exam. When you find them, just remember they could be pre-test questions. Here's a final question. Who is responsible for the high level estimates of backlog items? The answer to this, the team. I hope you enjoy this review. All the very best 
on your exam. Remember to be cool, calm, and collected. Remember not to sweat the small stuff. Just go, go, go. Believe you've got this. Believe you can do this. All the very best and bye for now.